this is Nancy Lee. She's with Resorts and Society. And um, she made me have to have this class because I was touring around and over in our Grandview greenhouse, she looked at a patch of tomatillos and said, there's a tomatillo bee. And I'm like, a tomatillo bee? <laughs> and it turns out there's a squash bee and an okra bee and a tomatillo bee. And they're that precise. They're that dialed in. And I just realized we want to learn to see those. We want to learn they exist and understand just how incredibly tailored to our well-being nature is. Um, and what risks we take when we decide that we know what the proper order is. And so that is the purpose of this. And this is Bren of Sprigley's um, Beescaping. Is that the? Right, exactly. Yeah, right. And we started talking about all this stuff and realized that it'd be a great combination to have both of these wonderful experts um, enlighten us about the incredible diversity of insects. And then they wrote me into it too. So <laughs> I'll try and bring a little bit of perspective about some of our preconceptions and how maybe they're not as useful as they might be. Yeah, so Pat's the best person I know to help people think about what we consider pests as prey and change how you see things so that, um, so that you preserve areas on your farm that are always providing a source of food for the beneficial predators and parasitoids. And um, so, yeah. Okay, I think that'll do it. Okay. Let's start. Well, great. Well, thanks everybody for coming. I just want to um, share some of these. This is um, a toolkit that Bee City um, USA in North Carolina applied for a grant from Duke Energy to um, get for all the affiliates who wanted to apply for them in North Carolina. And so this is the prototype. So um, some of the materials are still the personal materials of Kim Bailey who put it together. Do any of you know? Kim, I know Karen does, yeah. So anyway, she lent it to us and I thought it'd be a really neat thing. It's designed to be for pollinator walks. And so she has enough for 12 people. And so she, these little cards, if you download them from online, they're only little. And she has um, expanded them to these big, so it's a great field tool. And then she put together these three guides. You know, they just bought, the, so they got a grant to get all the materials and so, um, in North Carolina, I don't know if those grants are available from Duke, but um, if you're here in Hendersonville, you could borrow it. And then she has this little thing, it's from the Sunflower Project. This is one of the first citizen science projects related to pollinators. It's just standing at um, sunflowers, and it used to be a lemon queen, but now I think it's any kind of sunflower and monitoring the bees. And so there's the same thing, a lot of little information about the ones that are pretty easy to recognize. And a lot of times people think they don't know them, but then once you start to find out, they actually have recognized a lot of bees. And so they put together some neat things. This is really cool about the different antennae that bees have. And we can, I'll leave this out, we can take a look. And if people wanna use the nets, we have those. What I use is just a little plastic bag. And I ask people to collect a little piece of the plant if they don't know what it is. And then when we get back together, we can see what the plant was. But today we might just be observing, because when you're, when you're looking for predators and parasitoids, usually it's very hard to collect them. Um, but I do have some other tools. If you would like, you might want to borrow, it's a little hand lens. And then this is also a little hand lens, but you, you can capture the insect and put it in. Um, I, it magnifies to see what's inside. Yes, okay. right. And then the neat thing about this is if you did take a photograph, it has a grid on the bottom. So you could, um, you'd, have a, you'd have a way to measure how big it is. There's an effort to find rusty patch bumblebees in North Carolina. And what they're using is just jars, a small jar with a lid. So then they can take photographs. Because if you were trying to catch some big bees, like a big rusty patch, this would be kind of intimidating to try to do that, right? But if you have a big jar, it's fine. And I use the plastic bag. I've never been stung through a plastic bag anyway. So, And then this um, is something that Kim likes to use, especially with kids. And this, so that's another one. It's kind of fun. Um, Phyllis, who's the head of Bee City, she says sometimes she worries that insects' legs get caught in the... Yeah. But it's not super tight or anything. So I don't... I, I think it'd be hard unless you were getting a crane fly or something to hurt them. So if anybody wants to take this, you're welcome to borrow it. And please return it because um, we want to make sure we get everything back to her. And then she also has a place if you did want to um, put things... If you're a teacher or if you're going to be doing any kind of um, pollinator education in your community, these are um, 
um, what are they called? Tuning forks. Tuning forks. It should work on tomatoes or peppers, but she said that sometimes it's hard to see it. She said the best thing to use is the um, dead nettles. And what happens is some flowers have what are called porocidal anthers, and they hold the pollen until there's a certain vibration. And a lot of our native bees can release their wing muscles, and they cause the flower. They grab onto the, the flower parts, and they cause this vibration, and the um, pollen pours out, and you'll see it on their belly. And even little tiny bees, but they tend to be a little bit shy. So we can try um, hitting this next to the flower, and she says that the, the pollen just pours out. So. We're basically going to be like scouting and looking and showing, but if you see a bug, you can, if you think you can grab it to show us, that's fine. Yeah. If you were with a group, you could go scout and then return together and kind of compare. And oftentimes people collect things on the same plants, you know, at a certain time of day. Oh, there's a really cool insect here that I don't see very often that is considered a pest of yams. It's called a tortoise beetle. It's really beautiful if anybody wants to come see. So I don't know, are buckwheat really related to sweet potato? Because the leaves do look no, a lot. No, not too yeah. much. It's not related to sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are in the um, morning glory family and buckwheat is in the rhubarb family. Okay, wow. And here's a little jumping spider. There's a parasitic wasp that lays her egg in the tortoise beetle and her larvae eat the tortoise beetle from the inside out. There's some hoverflies. I'm going to show you guys a resource that Xerxes put together. It shows a lot of different lady beetles that are native and non-native. That's another harlequin. Okay. So that one, I think it's an assassin bug because it doesn't have yeah, fat legs. Because if it had fat legs, then that would be a leaf-footed bug. Oh, no, you know what? This is a squash bug, I think. That's <laughs> a squash bug, yeah. We've got a lot of invasive insects that have come over with the invasive plants as well, and just with the plant trade. Exactly. What is that one going right through there? So that's another fly. Now, a quick and easy way to tell flies apart from Hymenoptera, so say wasps and bees, is to look at the wings. And so flies only have two wings, okay. whereas wasps and bees have four wings. And so when they land, you can sort of see a little lump at the bottom of their wings where their second pair of wings kind of sticks out a bit. Okay. So if you can get close enough, you can very easily tell that that fly only has two wings. This might be my iconic bug, actually. This is a bug, and it's doing what Richard talks about. It's doing its Porsche thing, moving really fast. It's an egg eater. It's a native. It and the Pennsylvania soldier beetle are my asparagus beetle solution. If I have parsnips in bloom, they come in to feed on the nectar and pollen of the parsnips. Oh, and they okay, just eat all the eggs of the asparagus beetles off of my you asparagus beetle. Wow. So pass that around. Did you get did y'all get a look at it? That's the C Mac ladybug. Okay. And C Mac stands for Colio Megillia maculata. Which is why even the entomologists say C Mac. <laughs> That's a cucumber like a beetle. beetle. Cucumber beetle non native? I don't know really. Yeah, choose. I don't know either. This is a harlequin bug. Is that a native? Harlequin bugs are, I think, natives and a horrible pest for um, brassicas. That's what I thought. And also tomatoes sometimes. Even a good insect in too many numbers is a bad thing. So really, just by consuming insects constantly, birds are helping really keep the ecosystem in check. Um, so they're serving a huge point. Mm -hmm. When it gets hot in Virginia, uh, I start getting worms on my tomatoes. Mm. And <laughs> and I put cayenne pepper on my tomatoes, and okay. then they... It works? It works. Awesome, awesome. They stay away. That's good to know. So, um, and then if my leaves get too bad, I'll end up just using a little bit of uh, vinegar and um, soap. Oh, sure. Water. Right. Yeah, and, you awesome. know, because cause if you get them through August in Virginia, then you can get tomatoes all the way up to Right, November. right. Well, and, that, and I don't have a greenhouse, so this is all outside. Awesome, yeah. Know? Well, and so, it sounds like you've got a good hold on IPM, Integrated Pest Management, yeah. which is really all about establishing a threshold and getting through the worst time of year right. without wiping out the pests, but having them manageable. So exactly. you, still, yeah. you still can get your crops, but you're still not wiping out the exactly. pests and the things that really rely on those pests to survive. Right, yeah. Do people know wild lettuce? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's this guy here. And what happens is, if you go to pull it, all of the seeds float off everywhere. And the least little wind blows them everywhere. And in my slideshow, I say, if alive. And why I say that is because you can pull this guy and drop it, 
and it'll still make sea, and they'll still fly away. Oh. You know? I mean, just because you pulled it does not mean it's dead. Yeah. And every bit of life is going to making seed and spreading them everywhere. And we, we're constantly pulling these. They're absolutely everywhere. Of course, it's a composite. Those flowers are great for feeding the beneficials. It's not in the least bit pure bad. There isn't any pure bad, right? And then what I love about it and several other plants that I'm going to talk about in my slideshow, it's the focus of my slideshow, um, as they go to seed and they're dropping their defenses, right, as they put their energy into the most important thing, which is reproduction, they get hit with aphids. And people might go, oh, aphids, that's bad. They're bringing aphids in. Well, actually, it's great. Because when there's aphids, the things that eat aphids come. And the aphids are on a weed. We don't care if aphids are on a weed, right? Um, and indeed, goldenrod gets covered up with aphids every spring. I've never noticed goldenrod having a problem grow. You know, it manages to survive those aphids. But what happens is it feeds the beneficials. And ironically, Nancy and I did a bunch of scouting. And as soon as I saw the aphids, I said, we're going to see loads of beneficials. And I managed to find, I'm going to try and find it again, one parasitized um, egg, parasitized by a baconid wasp, and that was it. And likewise, we found, we found some places where there were milkweeds covered up with um, aphids. <coughs> and I should have seen all kinds of beneficials, and for some reason I'm not seeing them, probably because we're doing a class. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what he's talking about, he meant the aphid actually gets parasitized. And the larvae hatches out and eats the aphid from the inside, and it actually blows the body of the aphid up, and it looks like we call it a mummy, and it's brown. And so that's a sign that the parasitoid wasps are there. So if you didn't, um, one of the things that Pat likes to say is that we, instead of calling things pests, we need to think of them as prey for those um, parasitoid wasps and things that need to have food. If you cut an annual crop down, um, you're getting rid of all your pests and your beneficial, what we call beneficial. So I'm an ecologist. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. But the concept of a good and bad bug is kind of an oxymoron if you're an ecologist because everything has a role. But in agriculture, we use the term beneficial to mean pollinators and predators and parasitoids. So wasps, for example, could be predators they, that carry prey back to their nest to feed their young and lay their eggs or their parasitoids that lay their egg in the insect, in this case an aphid, and then it becomes a mummy. And we'll see a, um, a bean beetle that has been um, mummified. I, I found, they, there's a bunch, on, well, they, I don't know if there's a bunch, but I found one. We can there's see. a bunch, I promise you. Can I ask you, for, uh, can I ask you Claire, sure. uh, with the aphids you were talking about, the ones that are parasitized being brown and larger, uh -huh. so if you see, because some of them are red, some of them are green. Right, different colors. So if you see some that are larger and... Sort of buff colored. That's one that has a Yeah, and sometimes parasite. you'll see a tiny little hole, a perfect little hole, and that's where the adult, so the, um, the larvae are little grubs, just like you know, flies and wasps and bees all have a little grub-like larvae that could be um, like a caterpillar because they go through complete metamorphosis. And then when they pupate, and they use the casing of the aphid as their pupae shell instead of making a silk casing, and then they cut a little hole to get out, um, and that mean, that's when they're an adult wasp again. And so they're going to go lay their eggs in. And so that's one thing when we talk about pesticides, a reason to be extra cautious about using pesticides on things that get parasitized, because you could be killing all of your beneficials. You know, have you ever seen a tomato horned worm that's covered in little, those are all going to be adult wasps laying eggs. So instead of killing it, you might want to just grab a little piece of tomato plant and put it in a little container, keep an eye on yes. it. Yeah. And actually, it's kind of fascinating. Some of those eggs that parasitoid wasps lay um, actually turn into multiple wasps from one single egg. It's pretty rare, really, in the whole animal kingdom. Actually, I think the record for the number of young that comes from a single egg comes from a parasitoid wasp, and it's in the thousands. Wow. So sometimes thousands of wasps can come from just a single egg. Wow. So it's pretty incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine being dead. Uh, actually, the, uh, <laughs> the Pediobius the bean beetle predator we, act we actually released, which we'll see. We'll see the parasitized bean beetle larva. They're like brown cocoons. If anybody knows what a bean beetle larva looks like, they're not very big. 15 to 25 wasps come out of each one. Wow. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're quite prolific.
And um, I did try using the um, tuning fork on the tomato flower, and it it's I, I, I see why Kim said it was harder to see, but I could see a little um, a little cloud of pollen oh, cool. come out. Yeah. So if anyone wants to try it, where where are we? Didn't see anything come to the pollen that oh. came out. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, so should we go check out the um, bean beetles? Yeah, let's check out yep. the bean beetles. So we can walk around there, see the beans are um, there. just on the other side of, on sure the next, um, yeah. So a good place to find the parasitized uh, bean beetles on a leaf that you see that has been eaten a lot, because that's where the pupae would have um, um, attached itself. So and I'm that's where- So i this around so you can get a, an example of the wild lettuce in all of its stages, in flower, in, um, in seed, and under attack from aphids. Okay, and it's an ongoing relationship. And although today there are no parasitized aphids on here, it won't be long before there'll be all kinds of little brown or golden balls. And we got plenty of pictures if we don't get to see some in nature. Just pass and that around. And then also, like we were talking about earlier, an aphid congregation like that is exactly what a seerfid fly is looking for when it's laying its eggs. They'll lay their eggs right near that congregation, and their young will just munch away at aphids. If you people want to just turn over leaves and look for a dark brown, um, bean beetle-shaped But normally, cocoon. Patrick, this would be yellow, right? When yep. Not parasitic. Yes, Beans exactly. Are like little yellow, they, they, mushy things that I mush the heck out of. Yes, Look right. There, the yeah. wasp did it. Yeah. Here they are no longer yellow and they have 15 to 20 predators inside them. Yeah, this is it. Okay, so. This was a very small larva. It didn't get to get very big before it got hit. So what's going on here is every year we scout when we see larva, or even if we see eggs, we order cocoons. If we see larva, we order live wasp. And I've got a, on my phone, I can pass it around. I've got a little short video of, of how small they are. And so we release these um, in the cool of the evening. Okay. We just let them fly up and they immediately start ovipositing, laying their eggs in so the bean beetle cool. larva. Okay, so you actually order them. Okay. Yeah, we buy these. It's called Pediobius foveolatus. My joke is it took me 10 years to learn how to say it. Yeah, absolutely. Give me 10 more before I learn how to spell it. <laughs> but I probably could pull it off by now. And so this is not uh, native at all. It is naturalized where in the winter bean beetles keep reproducing. So once you get out of the mountains, they don't even have to buy it anymore. It's there. But we have to buy it every year. And so Karen wanted me to show her the wasp, and I said, how am I going to show you a wasp that is 10 to 25 of them inside one of these larvae? Yeah. It's just too small for me to ever catch it and show it, you know? Yeah. The only time I see the wasp is when I release it. The rest of the time, I know it's there because of the parasitized yeah. larva. This is the... They are, they are the, the, bee, the bean beetle larvas that have been had eggs laid in them, and now they're no longer bean beetle larvas. They're nurseries for Pediobius foveolatus is young. Okay. Um, so basically, these bees, uh, instead of making a nest to lay their eggs in, they make the prey make a nest of their own, a little protective shell. Is this, um, is all of this damage from the bean beetle feeding, or is this I would say probably, but it's, it's difficult to tell. Okay. Um, but they do eat pretty voraciously. It probably is all from them. Okay, so these are eggs, and they're eggs definitely of some kind of a uh, bug, I would say. And so they may well be a predatory bug, but they could also be a pest. But it's definitely eggs. You have to really know the difference. This is the Mexican bean beetle. Because of the shape, I'm going to guess that these are a bug. You know, true. People know when I when I say a bug what I mean. I don't mean just any insect, right? I mean a shield-shaped true bug. Examples being squash, squash bug, mm -hmm. harlequin bug, assassin bug, right? The leaf-footed, the great big bugs with the stuff yeah. on their feet and the lines across their back, those are all bugs, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Do you have any guess as to who the, who's these eggs are? Mm -hmm. And if not, let's talk about how to ID them. Okay. You know, I'm guessing it's a bug by the shape yeah, of the egg. Yeah, so, um so Pat has a book. I thought I had it, but I couldn't find mine. But and so we'll take a look, and we might be able to tell. And if it turns out that it's a predatory bug, we'll bring this leaf right back here. Okay. Because they're not all hatched out yet. Right. You okay. can see if you look at this, that some are hatched and some aren't. Yeah. Oh, Richard's right trick for harlequin bugs uh -huh. is to take the eggs and put them in a little container okay. and watch and see if see a harlequin comes bug comes out. out or a wasp. Right. If the wasp comes out, you put the eggs back outside. Right. That's <laughs> right. And that's what I was saying to do with the, if you found a yellow. 
bean beetle larva, mm -hmm. same thing. You could bring the leaf in and see if you got wasps out or right. not. Or, um, with that, as soon as it starts to turn brown, you know you've got yeah, the good guy right. and you put it back out yeah, in the patch. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go look at that celery area. Okay, so this guy here, I'm pretty sure, oh, is our spine soldier bug. Oh, great. Do you think you can get them? Do you want to try? I'll try. Mm -hmm. If I can catch them. Keep an eye on them, see if you can catch them. Mm -hmm. Or her. So we have our serpent fly again mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. And another one there. Um, they come in all in all sizes. So their larvae are tiny and sort of green. It's S Y R. P H I D, and right. so I've got pictures of both. It's hard to see the larva. They're kind of transparent. They're also yeah. yellow, though. They oh, can they be can be yellow? yellow. Okay. Oh, okay. Surface. Surface. Yes. It's mainly their young that are. Pred predaceous. Yep, that's one. Mm -hmm. They're also called hoverflies or flowerflies. Oh, okay. hover and so the um, and that looks like it might be a little wasp flying around down there. Can you see? Um, um, it, it looks a little bit redder. Oh, there's one. So there's a parasitoid wasp. Um, so that's that. Um, this wasp is what he released. I don't know. Is this what your wasp is, um, Pat? If you can see the wasp, it's not what I released. <laughs> the whole point is, the one I released is so small that 25 fit inside that little brown cocoon. Wow. You're not going to see it, okay? And indeed, people think wasp when they're afraid That's of it. That's called a This guy, bug. if it had a stinger, which it doesn't, those, it converted a stinger to an ovipositor. Seeds, but if it had a stinger, you would never feel it. It couldn't get through the top layer of your skin. This is just yeah. a stinger. Um, Yep, yep. That's a that, oh, spider. that's a stink bug. Yeah, but um, an egg, an egg that's great. You got one. So um, one way, if so, if you have stink bugs, and I should have brought my hand lens. Um, I don't know. If you can see, it's mouth part. So this is um, this is a a, a young one. So it doesn't. It's not fully developed. So an adult has fully formed wings. Mm. And um, they are what's called um, hemimetabolous. So they don't go through complete metamorphosis. They gradually mm. change into an adult. Mm. So one thing we don't always think about grasses as flowering, but um, um, they actually produce pollen. And so bees will visit to collect the pollen. But also, um, Pat points out that a lot of times aphids will live in the grasses around your farm. So if you can leave some grassy areas, that benefits bumblebees and some other bees that might um, nest or collect pollen, but it also is a great place for spiders and things that can recolonize your crops. And when years you... ago, a um, guy at Herb Farm was processing their milky oats, which of course is a grass, uh -huh. right? and we were in the lab while they were processing them, and on the windows, there were probably thousands of dollars worth of minute pirate bugs. Wow. They sell for like $75 for 500 Wow. Yeah. And then, just <laughs> tons and tons of them in all the windows trying to get out. <laughs> yeah. And why they had been on those milky oats is they were feeding on the pollen. Uh -huh. um, the bean beetle and the squash beetle are basically, there's not much that eats them, so they can get really out of control. Mm -hmm. So I'll buy a parasite for that. Yeah. But mostly, my yes. philosophy oh, is if I have a bug problem, increase the diversity. Mm -hmm. Feed everybody more, including the pest. Yeah. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter because it's about dynamics, mm -hmm. you know. So, so here's the spine that beetle that um, beetle. the spine bug. Sorry. Okay, we got we got ourselves. Um, we haven't ID'd it, but I'm I'm virtually certain that this is the squash, or I mean, is the spine soldier beetle. I've I've, I've been blessed by its um, predatory activity in my garden many a time, and I'm, it looks a lot like it to me. So we can look it up when we go we'll back. Look it up. Yeah. 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 Um, so we should pass that one around because that one you might see it again today. Notice the shoulders go well, go straight squash up. Squash <laughs> so what do they this eat? Pete's gonna pass it around. One around no, in that's the squash oh. beetle. Squash beetle. Okay. Yeah. And it looks very similar to the bean beetle. And they feed on the, like squash beetles will feed on beans. Mm -hmm. yeah. They feed back and forth. Yeah. But the good news is Pediobius yeah, takes them both out. Uh -huh. you know? yeah. They're closely closely related enough that if we looked at the squash, we'd see those brown mummies there too. This is a bachelor button. And an important thing to know about bachelor buttons is it gives me the opportunity to introduce the concept of extra floral nectaries. So plants don't just put nectar in their flowers. 
right? Nectar's a bribe, right? It's to bring the insects in so that they carry the pollen away. It also bribes insects to come in and defend plants. So extra pearl nectaries are actually in the case of peonies, there are extra pearl nectaries on the flower buds so that the ants get up there to feed on them and help the bud to open because it's such a big bud. And so in the case of a of a bachelor button, it's more likely that what they're doing is feeding the beneficial insects so they'll eat the aphids and control the pests that attack it. So where are the extra, are they on the sepal? Are they on the below the flower? Well, they're you, I'd say they, um, I haven't actually looked for where they are. I've just read that they exist. So they'd be likely to be someplace close to the flower bud or also they could be um, on the base of the leaf. So plants also produce resins and oils, and sometimes those are to help them keep from desiccating. But a lot of insects will collect those for no, other it's okay. it's a, it's uses for antibacterial properties or antifungal properties or to attract a mate or lots of different reasons. So folks, here we have an example, okay? This is a teaching moment, okay? Uh, my friend here, your name is Aaron, had a leaf put a bug on his hand. And he said, so it is a pest? I said, well, it's a plant feeder, but we don't kill it. And he's like, I said, is it, are you causing damage? He said, well, if it's there, it wouldn't it spread disease? I mean, he just, I can tell he's not comfortable. It's not a good bug, so therefore I should kill him. So here's no, the leaf footage the bug. Exact, right. Uh huh. <laughs> but what I, so we have them, and there's, you know, if there's like 300 of them on your, on your plants really right here. You know. Are you seeing damage? Mm -hmm. Are your plants not growing well? They have damage. I don't are know if that's damage from the bug, though. But are, are, the plant, are the plants producing for you? But they're yes. not producing well. They're not producing well. Well, then I would try, I would, I would then go to extension and, and bring that in and bring the plant in and see if you can then tie the damage to that bug. Yeah. I've not seen the leaf foot of bug that really cause any significant damage here. You know, you might have an imbalance where for some reason things aren't controlling them enough and they are causing, causing damage. You know? But, you know, here I don't have any reason to so kill it. incidental mm -hmm. plant feed. Jumping spider. Um, if anyone has a hand, like, it's really what, fun. they're the ones that have like um, all the eyes, a bunch of eyes all together on the front, and they tend to look right at you when you go over to them rather than running away. This is probably, um, yeah, I think it's probably the southern plant bug, and that is a pest. But we'd have to ID it for sure. There's a small chance it could be a beneficial predator. You know, it's a bug for sure. Here's a little um, jumping spider. And they're the ones that have like. Um, all the eyes, a bunch of eyes all together on the front. And they tend to look right at you when you go over to them rather than running away. Where's like, <laughs> um, he jumped. Oh, did he? Yeah, oh, I think okay. it's probably the southern plant bug. Oh, okay. That is a see. But we'd have to eye for sure. So if you can see her face, yeah. oh, she's sure. looking mm -hmm. this oh, way oh, now. Okay. Look at that. So it's she's, like she's showing head. her back that looks like face oh, too, right? right? Yeah. But if you could see her the front of her face, um, I, yeah, they, they're really neat. They're really neat. That, that is a cucumber beetle, and I do kill those. They're a problem in this greenhouse, you know, if I can. What is the best control for those? There's a bunch of different controls. Um, the best control is to have abundant Pennsylvania soldier beetles out at the right time. Um, These little flowers are good for pollinators and beneficial other um, predatory and parasitoids. This here, one of the most reviled weeds, nobody can imagine eating it as a seedling, is there on my table almost every day of the summer. Yeah, and our forager mentioned that it was edible too. So what, what is it called? Weed? Called gallon soga, also known oh, as yeah, gallon devil, soga. Right. white weed, no business weed. Um, in France they call it German weed, in Germany they call it French weed. <laughs> And just um, just now there's little bee on it. So those little tiny flowers are good for parasitoid wasps and little bees and um, parasitoid flies, lots of little um, insects. So you say it's on your kitchen table. What do you do? Uh, I, just eat it I'm raw? eating it. Are you eating yeah. the leaves? Or like leaves, the, the leaves. I wouldn't eat it at this stage, too much trouble. I get it when it's young, we'll see it in the garden. But it, may, it grows its own succession crops. There's the one over there that's nice. There, there's one in the path there. These are the eggs of the squash bug. They're gorgeous. Well, yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, they're gold, brown. <laughs> but there's, but there's also a beneficial that has golden eggs like that. So don't. So oh, you, so I might be wrong then. So there's. Um, so we need to look up the other one. I forget what it is. 
So okay. you have to. Let's I might be wrong. This yeah. is not on a yeah, yeah. plant. So which okay. one do you think that so is? Beautiful. Oh, I don't um, get those. It could have been. Oh, so yeah. then they've all hatched out anyway. So I think. Okay. Anyways, if you see bronze eggs like this or golden eggs like this on squash, then it's very likely a squash bug. Yeah. That's a C-Mac, Another C-Mac ladybug. Yeah. 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 The good one. Can we, can we see yeah. that? Yeah. I used to think that was a bad one. I know. Well, you got to yeah. stop yeah. thinking about yeah. bad and good. I know. It's like you in don't life. Don't judge until yeah. you people. know. Oh, right. Totally. You got to get to know people, people yeah. before you hate them. Yep. Well, I mean, I would, I would, I would identify whether or not they are the culprit.